Hi friends, this is Dainty Tank, thank you for joining me, welcome back to Please Be Happy. This is part 25 in our series and we've got a sir with us. If you don't know a sir, it's my adorable cat Pixel and he's chosen my lap and right now to cuddle. So one of my hands is completely busy petting a cat. In the meantime though, let's actually jump back into where we were. <laughs> you make this hard, sir. You make this hard. Okay, load. Oh yeah, that's what happened. Oh yeah. So we're in the middle of a, uh, a potential play. And we had a big heart to heart last time. All right. In the morning after, I get up and out of bed. I have a quick breakfast on my own since I slept in. Then, once I'm ready, I take a short walk to the stop where I can get on the shuttle and ride, ride it the rest of the way there. The driver takes us to the direction of the Bell House in Aspen's apartment. I've walked down these roads so many way, so many times that it feels strange to see them rush by the windows, like I'm fast forwarding through a TV show. That's, you know how to fast forward? Did you have, do you have like DVR? I'm surprised. Uh, at some point we have to. Make, we take a turn that I've never taken before, and soon we're going through areas that are new to me. I watch them go by, not paying enough attention to commit the memory. Eventually, I stop and disembark. <gasps> As I get my first whiff of the clean air, I understand why it's a preserve. Oh! <laughs> As far as I can see, the land is covered in forest, not just trees, but forest. Grown so thick that it looks like a solid wall of green. The only exception is a river that winds through the hills where the water is crystal clear and still. The nearby botanical gardens were lovely, but this is something else. This is something more. Oh. So that's a choice. So we're, we're visiting the bird. I do miss traveling to new places. I'm glad to have settled down now. Oh no, I, I do miss traveling to new places. It's been a while since I've been anywhere that felt, li felt this way. I like having a home, but I miss seeing new places too. If it weren't for my magic, I'd like to start traveling again. Now that I have somewhere to come back to. I quietly pay for my ticket and then hurry out as fast as I can. I see why Juliet said that they wouldn't be able to help me find my bird. There are a ton of places it could be. That doesn't mean I, can, I can't try. Maybe if I found the person who took the bird in, they'd know what happened to it. I might have better luck just looking for it myself though. It's a big place. I decide. Too big for me to try and explore on my own. I should look for Juliet's friend, Amia. I should have asked Juliet how to contact her before I left. I'm sure Juliet's asleep by now, and I don't want to disturb her. Besides, it's not like I'm in a hurry. Taking my time, I try to see as much as I can. It's not crowded, but the preserve is far from empty, too. There are not just- there are just as many fabled as there are humans. Some are recognized, like a fawn and a dryad. I wonder if the trees make any of them feel like I do. If any of them have a story like I do. Come from someplace far away, like I do. There are t kids too, human kids with their teachers being led around by their tour guides. Lots of them look excited to be here. I hope, maybe, they can learn to love it as well. I asked some of the guides or instructors if they know who and where Amia is. Some of them have no idea what I'm talking about. Some know her, but not her location. Finally, I find someone who's able to point me in the right direction. I end up back near where I started, near the edge of the river. Sure enough, the lady from before is there, talking with another guest. I wait until they finish their conversation before I approach. Excuse me. Hi, how can I help you? Hi, Amia? Um, a few weeks ago, you picked up a hurt bird from my friend Juliet. I was wondering if you could tell me where it is now. Oh, right. My poor guy. I'm afraid the little fellow didn't make it. 
Oh. I think that when he took the tumble that hurt his leg, he must have hurt something inside him too. Oh. It's dead? I hadn't even thought about that possibility. This whole time I just assumed it'd be alive. That he'd gotten better. It's sad, but it's the way of nature sometimes. Mind if I ask how you were involved? Naturally, she doesn't remember me being there. I was the one who found it and brought it to Juliet's. I wasn't around when you picked it up, though. Oh, right, right. Well, you can sleep easy and know that you did what you could. She sounds so casual about it. I guess she's probably experienced this a lot. Yeah, you, you sometimes lose them. Meanwhile, I don't know what to say. I just stand there surprised. It was just a bird, sure. But that's still something. For the bird, it was everything. Mia starts to walk away, but before she can leave, there's something I want to know. Something I've never gotten much thought to before, but that most recent time with Silver has made me wonder about. Hey... I have a question. Shoot. Do you believe in fate? That's a big question to ask someone. She stares at me with mild shock. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird thing to ask, I know, but I hold her gaze and don't back down. Now there's a question. Looking past me at the water, she takes a deep breath and lets it out slowly. If you're asking if I think there's a world out there where that bird survives or never gets hurt to begin with, then sure, maybe. I'm not smart enough to know, but it's not this one. Destiny, luck, whatever you want to call it. Life's unfair, that's a fact. It doesn't care about any one of us. Sometimes you can do everything right and it just isn't enough. Mm. I don't think that's destiny personally, that's just being alive. Being here, doing what I can to help who I can, that's just me playing my part in life. If that's because some invisible force led me, then it doesn't change anything. That's a good point. Does it matter? No, at the end of the day. Hi. Yes, I see you. I have a sir. Yes. He's also the reason I've been missing a lot of recordings. He's been sick. He's doing better now, but he's got chronic illness and every now and then he needs more attention. Bigger picture or not, it's what I choose to do with my time right now. And I choose to believe that makes a difference. I hope that helps. It's very sweet. Thanks. Don't mention it. Say hi to Juliet for me, will you? Yeah. No problem. Once again, she starts to walk away, and this time I don't stop her. Instead, I walk out to the nearby gazebo and sit down, surrounded by quiet water. Even though her reasoning was totally different, I can't help but think about how Amelia pretty much said the same thing Silver did. It was just a bird, and that's just a lot, and that's just life. Silver, who tried to let it die, and Amelia, who tried to help it live. I wonder how Silver would feel if she'd heard the news. I'm sure she'd pretend not to care, but she did follow me all the way back to the library just to see. On the other hand, Amia didn't seem all that upset. I could tell she didn't know why it mattered to me. Like always, it's hard for me to answer that question myself. I know how nature works as well as either of them. I know better than I expect to care. That doesn't mean I can't, though. Even if no one else sees it, that bird was still as alive as we are. Maybe it doesn't read books or drink or coffee or watch TV, but it still existed. It ate and it flew and it sang. The forest of on Mount Victoria will be a little bit more quiet from now on, even if nobody notices. It wouldn't be able to tell the difference itself. I know. I wouldn't be able. It's not like that bird and I were friends. Still, whenever I go back, I'll think about it, and think about the tree that used to be its home, the nest that I'll never return to. Sighing, I stand up and start walking again, 
Despite how it turned out, I'm still glad I came to this place. Still glad it exists. It might not be perfect, but it's doing the best it can. Oh. Oh! I spent a few hours wandering around the preserve. Never run out of things to see. There are birds and lizards and all kinds of other creatures, plus a forest that reminds me of Korea. The calm beauty of it all helps me feel better after hearing about the bird. At least it got to spend its last few days in a place as gorgeous as this. After a while, I leave the park and wait for a shuttle to take me back where I, where I came from and then walk the rest of the way to the library. Once I'm home, I spend the rest of the day napping. I'm watching TV while I wait for Juliet to wake up. That night, I'm dozing in my room, drifting in and out of sleep when there's a knock on my door. Three knocks, like always. Come in. The door swings open and Juliet stands there. I leap to my feet, sleepless sleepiness disappearing in an instant. <laughs> Good evening, Mia. Good evening. Hey. Aww. She welcomes me into her arms with a hug and a kiss. I'm sure last night's conversation is still front and center in her mind. The two of us go downstairs and Juliet starts preparing tea and setting a mug at both of our spots at the table. How was your visit to the nature preserve? It was really nice. I had no idea there was a place like that in Wellington. All those trees. It was even more impressive than the gardens or Mount Victoria. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Were you able to find your bird? Well, kinda. I found a Maya at least. She told me that the bird passed away. Oh no, Miho. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I know they did all they could to help it. All of us did. I think I'll go back some time. Just to look around. I feel like I could spend days there and still find new things. I'd like to go with you sometime. It's been years since I've gone to visit myself. That sounds great. I'd love to see it with you. Yeah. Like a date. Mmm. Date. <laughs> with a smile, Juliet pours us both some tea and sits down. I dump sugar into mine while she leaves hers untouched. <laughs> it's a date then. Hey! I was also wondering if you might accompany me somewhere tonight as well. Oh, where is that? Oh, sure. Where did you want to go? Oh, buddy. Hi. Do you want to go down? Can you get down? No, you're going to just walk around. So this is Pixel. He's a loving creature. And he does interrupt our recording sometimes. Like today. May I read? <laughs> snuggles. I can't read. I got a snuggles. Well, as I'm sure you know, tomorrow is Halloween. Ooh. It was always Cassette's favorite holiday. It's also a day to honor the dead. I am so glad Cassette loves Halloween. That's such a queer thing to do. I think Cassette is like a queer icon. Is what I'm what I'm hoping. Every year at midnight, I go to lay flowers at her grave. I reach across the table, offering my hand, which Juliet takes. Of course, I'll go. Buddy, please sit down. <laughs> Thank you. I thought perhaps we could leave some flowers for Zhang Ying as well. Only if you want to, of course. Put your butt down or you get off. Yes. I like that. I'm sure they loved flowers. I know I do. Okay, I'll swap hands. I'm sure they'd be grateful to receive them. Some human traditions and rituals still seem foreign to me, and not something I'd think about doing myself. 
That was true for plenty of other things that I now take for granted, like holding hands and drinking tea. Once we've both drained our cups, we head out into the night together, beginning to walk to the cemetery. Along the way, Julia guides us to the patch of wildflowers, where she picks some to leave for Cassette. The ones she chooses have white petals and blue one and purple ones. Almost like Gerby. I pick a handful that are dark blue. They remind me of the clothes Junin was wearing when I first met them. Like usual, it's practically the only ones that out this late. <laughs> like usual, we're the only ones out this late. We pass by lights with the lights. God, we pass by houses with the lights off and curtains drawn and shops that are too dark to see into. I used to be more comfortable in the night time when I felt invisible and secure. Although I don't feel the need to be hidden just to be safe anymore, I still enjoy the quiet calmness it provides. Some of, sort of like the natural preserve earlier. We reach the cemetery and Juliet leads the way down several trails and through the trees. I remember which grave is Cosette's, even though it doesn't look much different from the others. Juliet and I both come to a stop in front of, uh, at the same time, pausing in front of the simple memorial. She stoops down and wipes some dust away from the nameplate and leaves the bundle of flowers that she chose. They're wrapped in a small ribbon that she brought with her and held in place by a small rock. Then she steps back to stand beside me. Aww. I don't say anything, but silently take her hand again. She squeezes tightly. The last time we were here, I ran away, as the reality of death and human, human mortality hit me. Now knowing what I do and having accepted it, I can appreciate Juliet's loss so much more. So much love and so much of her life are buried just a few feet beneath us, with only a small stone to represent it all. Juliet clears her throat and, still facing Cassette's grave, begins to speak. Even now, so many years after Cosette passed away, it still surprises me sometimes that she's gone. When I wake up, I half expect to hear her laughter from the hallway, or see her reading in the library, or find her shoes by the back door. By holding on to these little memories, these little paints. I thought I could keep her alive in my heart. There's no one else left to remember her. The way her laugh sounded. The books she enjoyed. The clothes she preferred. So I clung to those memories. For fear that they would cease to exist if I didn't. Oh. I've told you, Miho. I've tried to live to honor Cosette by doing my part to create the kind of world she dreamed about living in. A world of kindness and hope. Believe it or not, that was easy. Any pain or trouble was acceptable so long as it took me closer to that goal. Until one day, it wasn't. At the time, I thought that helping you was just another step down the path I had chosen for myself. But as time went on, and you blossomed and learned to live, it made me realize that I had reached a dead end. Aww. I had spent so long striving for this new world that I forgot to appreciate the one around me. And when I realized that, I felt trapped. Were I to stray from my path, I didn't know where it would take me. My world wasn't there anymore. Not just Cosette. Not just the people we knew. Technology improved. People's lives improved. And everything moved forward. Everything but me. Oh, you saying you're a relic of the past? Like, it does feel like you're behind times in quite a bit. Almost like you kind of froze when Cosette left. All I could think to do was run away. As I always have when 
faced with a difficult problem. Whether throwing myself off for the world or refusing to face a life without my daughter. The only direction I've ever been able to move is backwards. Last night, when you told me that you wanted to do the things I'd like to do, for me to take the lead more often. Being with you is the first thing I've wanted for myself in a long, long time. To the point where I'm not even sure how to do that. Oh, oh. Finally, it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm flustered. Juliet makes me flustered. Finally, Juliet faces me. Just like last night. Just like in the library. Just like so many other times before. Can you show me? Can you show me how to move forward? I gently take both of Juliet's hands and guide them to my heart, holding them against me. I can feel every beat and know that she can too. We can figure it out together. You already helped me with that, after all. After I found out Jongin was dead, I felt the same way. Like I didn't know what else to do with my life, or with myself. Oh. If you think about it, by searching for them for so long, I'd been doing the same thing you were all this time. But it was because of you and Aspen that I decided to stay in Wellington. The two of you showed me how to keep going, even when I didn't know where to go. And how just because they aren't around anymore, that doesn't change what they did for me. I wouldn't be here talking to you if it wasn't for them. So I'll always be grateful for that. Even though they've been gone for so long. That's so beautiful. I turned to look at Cassette's grave beside us. It would be fair to say she's changed my life, too. Indirectly. It's the same thing with you and Cosette. She made your life great. And I'm sure you made hers great, too. I didn't know her. But from everything you've told me about her, I'm sure she wouldn't want you to hurt or feel sad about her all the time. I'm sure she would have wanted you to smile when you think of her. And to find lots of other reasons to smile, too. Juliet also studies the moonlit grave. I wonder if she's picturing Cassette the person, or she's seeing the stone for what it is. After a long time, she nods. Yes. Yes, I do believe you're right. I'll never stop loving her. Or missing her. She lived a wonderful life, and died a peaceful death. She'll remain at peace forevermore. But I'm still alive. And it's time that I acted like it. Hell yeah. You're alive. Make it what you want. Be it immortal or not. We can make a new life for ourselves here. One step at a time. Together. Together. Right. Together. You're not alone anymore. Neither of us are. I just have one question, though. You said here. Does that mean that you'll stay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll go. But I want it to be because both of us want to. Not just me. Yeah! Woo! <laughs> you guys should just go on a tour of like all of the overworlds. Like, don't go to the underworld where like you have a timer on your life. Go to like Korea and like I don't know other places that are in the sky. There's plenty of time for that in the future. Right now, I think I'd like to learn to enjoy Wellington again, to see it the way you do. Fresh and exciting. Yes. Put the memories aside and go have fun. I like that too. Yes. Relief washes over me like a wave. I was prepared to go with her if it's 
what she really wanted to. Oh, You were gonna go to the Underworld? Aww. But I'd rather stay here for a while longer. Yeah! Do. After that, it feels like I can finally relax without worry following me around. Juliet and I are still together, and we're not going anywhere. Whatever happens next, I'm sure we'll be able to handle it. Because we have each other. I let go of Juliet so that I could step forward and place the flowers that I brought for Jonin on the ground beside Cosette's grave. They're a little bit smushed, but I'm sure that's alright. I don't think they'd mind. Almost immediately, a light breeze picks up, scattering the bundle lightly in the winds. I think that's alright, too. I'll never forget about Johnny and neither. No matter how far I go and how many people I meet, they will always be special to me. They set up, set me on my own path, the one that I walked for decades. If I could somehow tell them about everything I've seen, done since then, and about the new adventures that I'm sure to have with Juliet, I think they'd be just as excited for me as I am. I'm sad I never got to thank them properly, but just as just like Cosette and Juliet, I think that living my life to its fullest is the best way that I could do that. Juliet and I stay quiet for a little bit longer, both reflecting on everything. Finally, she puts her arm around me and gestures with her hand in the direction where we came from. Well, shall we be getting back to the library? I imagine you could use some rest before tomorrow evening's activities. Sounds good to me. I'm ready to go if you are. Julia turns to give one last look at the grave. The flower she placed shake in the breeze, while Miner spread further and further. She smiles at me. Yes. I think I'm ready. Woohoo! We got everybody! Sunday evening. As the wind. as the day. the words. As the day winds down and starts to get l darker, a light breeze starts to pick up. Not enough to be cold, but enough to make me glad I have my jacket. Aspen, Juliet, and I sat on the front porch with the lights on, watching the road. How long until people start showing up? Oh my god, it's Halloween, you're giving out candy. Soon, I'd imagine. The early evening is when most trick-or-treating begins. I'd better hurry before Miho eats all the candy. Can't argue with that. <laughs> I unwrap another piece and stuff it in my mouth, shoving the wrapper into my pocket with a bunch of others. Maybe if you go knocking on doors, you could convince people you're a kid in a costume too. That way you could get your own candy. Do you think that would work? <laughs> Miho totally is on board. It's hard to talk with my mouth full of chocolate and caramel. Oh, that sounds great. No, but it's funny to imagine. Oh, look. Here come a few of them now. Sure enough, a group of three kids appears at the bottom of the hill and start making their way up towards us. I stand up with a giant bowl in my hands. Oh, how cute. One of the kids has a white sheet draped over them with big holes cut out for their eyes. The other two are dressed like characters I've seen on TV. Trick or treat! Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> I love trick or treaters. <laughs> uh, it wasn't until uh, the dainty wife and I got our current place that like trick or treating could happen. Never had that experience before, and I, like people actually go door to door, and it was so good. The three of them hold out open pillowcases, and I toss a handful of candy into each one. Here you go! The one with big eyes goes even more wide-eyed. Whoa, that's a lot! Thanks a bunch! Wait, was it? Should I take some back? <laughs> Aspen swats at me gently. You can't do that. The three hurry off, probably afraid that I was going to get reach in and reclaim some of the candy. Sit back down. How much am I supposed to give them? Usually a piece or two, but it's not a problem. We still have several unopened bags inside. Sweet. Great. 
I grab another piece for myself and munch on it. Well, in that case... Are you going to grab a piece? Aspen reaches over and picks up a couple candies for herself, too. <laughs> it wasn't long before the next batch of kids shows up with another case, uh, close... The uh, next bunch of kids shows up with another close behind them. Second group even has some parents accompanying them. Hi. Yes, I know. You're grumpy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting smacked by a tail. Aww. It gets later and later, but more kids start arriving. Rather than less. I hand out candy until my arm gets tired. Naspin takes over. And more than once, Juliet has to go inside and get more bags of candy to refill the bowl. This is more work than the library on a busy day. Even my first day of work, when Aspen helped me run on the desk, felt less busy than this evening does. But also, it's a lot of fun. Many of the kids have creative costumes, and I even recognize some of the characters they're dressed as. The less creative co uh, costumes are still cute too, and it's nice seeing so many happy smiles as they walk away. It's not until the moon is high in the sky that the trick-or-treaters stop showing up. We can still hear the occasional whoop and shout from the streets nearby, but no one else comes up the path. Are you getting up, sir? No. Okay. Big bowl of candy is nearly empty, with less than a full layer left behind. A bunch of empty bags fill one of the recycling bins. In the end, we manage to go through all of the candy <laughs> Juliet bought. After about ten minutes without any more kits, we finally get up from the porch. I believe we can call it a night. That was certainly the busiest Halloween I've ever been a part of. <laughs> really? I didn't know if that was normal or not. For Welly, maybe. But I don't get many trick-or-treaters at my apartment. And back home, there are like maybe five kids in town at any given time. Ooh. More candy for you! <laughs> Speaking of which, I hope I can count on the two of you to finish off the leftovers we have here. You don't even have to ask. I'd better take what I can before Miho claims it all for herself, shouldn't I? Yes. Not if I beat you to it, anyway. Aww. Laughing, the three of us clean up everything, and then finally head back inside the library. That was quite fun, but I do think I'm ready for bed. I... Is something wrong? Uh. I, I barely register words. Something is wrong. But I don't know what. As soon as I walk through the front door, I can tell. But I can't place what it is. Miho? Both of them stop walking, watching me with concern. Hi. Finally, it hits me. It's cold. It's cold. It doesn't take me long to spot the source. One of the windows near the shelves, not far from Aspen's usual table, is wide open. Curtains flutter with the breeze. Two of them follow my line of sight. Oh, did we forget to close this? No. Someone's inside. But then, that doesn't make sense, does it? Why would we have just opened one of the windows? We wouldn't. That window was definitely shut earlier. It's Halloween. Maybe some kid snuck in here as a prank. Is anything missing? The three of us looking around, inspecting the shelves, front desk, everything in between. If something's gone, it's not immediately visible. I can't see anything out of the ordinary. Me either. Yeah. Something still doesn't sit right with me. I'm gonna go look upstairs. The other two follow behind me. Juliet goes to check her office, but appears untouched. Aspen waits at the top of the stairs watching. Meanwhile, I go to my room. Grabbing the handle, I push the door open and turn on the lights. I can hardly believe what I see. My window is open too. My bed sheets and pillows are strewn across the room like someone climbed across the bed. What few other possessions I have are also scattered around the room as if a tornado had blown through. Miho? 
Is something amiss? I hear both of them hurry my way as I remain frozen in my room behind me. Aspen gasps at as she glimpse gets a glimpse of my room. Who? Why? I have a feeling I already know the answer to one of those questions, but not the other. Silver. Stepping inside, I mechanically pick up my things and put them back where they belong. Everything is here except for my scroll. The little piece of paper, the only belonging that I really care about, is nowhere to be seen. I check under my bed and in every nook and cranny just to be sure, but it's gone. The fact is, all the confirmation I need. I'll be back. I push my way past Aspen and Juliet's shocked faces and dash back downstairs. Both Aspen and Juliet shout after me as I barrel out of the library, but I ignore them both. The instant I'm outside, I transform and keep running. There's no question of or doubt as to who took my scroll, but the question is why. As angry as I could be, force myself to stamp down the feel that feeling down, at least until I know Silver's reasons. The path to Mount Victoria is more crowded than I've ever seen it, but the roads and sidewalks are full of people, mostly parents with their kids. Some of them point and cheer as I run past. But I don't give them a second thought. None of them try to stop me or get in my way. By the time I climb the mountain and reach Silver's part of the forest, it's dark. She isn't in any of her usual spots, but I can sense that she isn't far away. Racing through the darkness, I keep my nose near the ground, hot on her trail. Then suddenly, just like last time I find her, she moves in the darkness, a patch of shadow that's a different color than the rest. Her bead glows as vibrant as ever, illuminating her wrist. It shines on the unfurled paper in her hand. Like always, she waits with her back to me. So you came. Of course I did. Give me back my scroll. I keep my distance, but reach out my hand. She was just a few steps away, tilting her head to look up at the starry sky. No, not the sky, the trees. Follow her gaze upwards and realize something. I've been here before. I recognize this tree. It's the bird. It's the one the bird fell from. That makes me pause. Has she been wondering about it all this time? Is this her way of asking? She did follow me all the way home. I soften my voice, but know that I may as well be blunt. It died, you know. They weren't able to save it. Her posture doesn't change, but by the subtle lit of light of her bracelet. I can see her fingers clutch the edge of my scroll more tightly. I met the woman who rescued it. She said the same thing that you did. That's just how nature is. Silence. Gritting my teeth, I tried to contain my growing frustration. Normally I can tolerate her silence, but tonight, instead of just coming to talk like she knows I would, she steals my most beloved possession and makes me chase her out here. All so she can ignore me. Don't you have anything to say? You must have come here for a reason, didn't you? More silence. Not even a breeze disturbs it. Finally, I've had enough. I step forward, snapping a branch beneath my shoes. Hey! Answer me, damn it! Stop acting like you don't care about anything! That gets her attention. She looks at me over her shoulder, her face hidden except for her eyes, and then faces me. Were you to happen upon another burn, more broken than the first, would you still try to save it? Yeah. Of course. Even knowing that your effort is likely to be futile? Yeah, even then. At least there's a chance it would work out. You speak like a human. Fighting against the inevitability of death. While we could watch the river of life from its shores, you choose to struggle upstream. Why? It's worth it! Why? Because otherwise, it all just passes by. I did what you said and watched from the shores for so long, because I didn't even think about joining it. But once I did... Once I let someone pull me in, I realized I like it more this way. It's hard sometimes. 
I haven't even been trying that long, but those hard times just help me appreciate the good ones more. Or even at all. There's someone I met who was also afraid of getting hurt, and someone else who was afraid of just passing by. They showed me that those are parts of life too, just like death is for a lot of people. Who cares about living forever if you don't care about being alive? Immortal or not, it's all we have. Yep. You and me, my friends, that bird, it's the same for all of us. I could have run away. I thought about it a million times. It would have been a lot easier than staying. But I did stay. And so now, here I am. Someone took a chance on me once, too. Even if I wouldn't have died, they still saved my life in a way. I thought it would be impossible for someone like me, like you and me, that it wasn't even worth the effort to try and change things. But I was wrong. And I'm glad that I was. And so that's why I do the same thing all over again, with a burn. Because if there's even a chance, it's worth trying. Although I don't say it, I can't help but think even talking like this is something relatively new for me. Unlike Silver, who talks more like Aspen's old books most of the time. It just goes to show that there's a lot of different paths our lives could have taken. But they both brought us here together. While Silver is still thinking about why I said her eyes suddenly go wide at the same time, that I feel something warm on my neck. Holding my necklace. Okay, you are stretching. You are stretching, and I am putting you down. Thank you. <laughs> Holding my necklace where I can see it, both Silver and I just stare as my bead brightens before our eyes. The glow intensifies to the point that Silver has to shield her eyes and look away, although somehow it doesn't bother me. I almost watch as another eyelash thin crack appears, and then another. For a moment, I half expected to just shatter. But it stops after a third crack, still holding itself together. The light from it also dims a bit, but it's still brighter than it was. When I let go and it falls back against my neck, my bead feels heavier than normal, too. Silver is able to look at me again, and through the shock had faded from her expression, her eyes still stay fixed on my bead. She laughs, but it's humorless. Shaking her head, she continues to stare at my necklace instead of my eyes. I had hoped that by looking at this, I might be able to learn your secret. Some magic spell or incantation that you had invoked. At the very least, I thought I might understand. Even as I read it, I thought that I must be missing something. For what meaning could such simple instructions hold? Even as you arrived here, I hope that perhaps you would reveal some missing part of the puzzle. So Silver can read it. So golden was your light as I approached your library that I thought it must be someone else. So bright that I could see it clearly. The same color as the person close to you. Now... I don't know if I should be disappointed or not to find there is no secret to these worms. Is there? Holding my scroll in front of her face the same way I held my eyes, her eyes glide across the characters. Su Bo Kang Yong. Please be happy. Aww. What simple nonsense. And yet... How could I deny that you've taken it to heart, when your very aura tells me your truth? It's all I can do to blink, to breathe, to stay standing upright as the world narrows to just the two of us, all awareness and everything else falling away from me. Confusion is just as plain on Silver's face at my reaction as I struggle to speak. You... you can read it? That's what it says? After years of looking and trying to understand, she could just read it like that? Silver, who knows? 
Who says she cares nothing for people and their lives or culture? I'm not the only one stunned. The parchment falls from Silver's hand as she drops it in shock. Flutters to the ground and stays there, even as the budding breeze starts to blow. That shock changes into understanding, and then Silver laughs again. Really laughs, for the first time I've ever seen. Her usual dignified and threatening pose is gone as she laughs so hard that it goes around the woods, clutching her chest. It's all she can do to remain upright. She acts like she heard the world's funniest joke. Still, just like earlier, I'm not sure what if there's any humor in it. Finally, with a groan, she retrieves my scroll and then straightens up, wiping her eyes. You're serious, aren't you? You never knew what it said before now. No. I shake my head. I would call you a liar if you were anyone else. You've made a fool of me without even trying. Or rather... I've made a fool of myself. That. I thought your glow was the result of those worms. But. You achieved that by yourself. Whatever it is you feel, it's something you've learned on your own, isn't it? You. truly believe all the things you said. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not on my own. I had a lot of help along the way. But yeah, I mean it. Every word. I reach out I, I reach out a hand again, taking a step forward, then another, then another. I step just in front of Silver. All she has to do is take the final step forward. I don't demand anything, just reach. She has my hand warily, like a stray dog trying to decide if it should trust someone. I hold my breath, waiting. With a rustle, she pushes the paper into my hand and then backs away, looking at the ground. Your path is different than mine. We may have more in common than I once thought, but I still cannot follow behind you. Oh, but you made so much progress today! Though I can understand why you walk it. I nod. And I understand why you said no. I hope you change your mind someday. Perhaps. Although, I do not think we'll meet again. Wait, why not? Are you leaving? Soon. I don't know when. I haven't decided. But I made up my mind before I ever visited your library. Oh. You're disappointed. I am. You're the first other Gumio I've ever known. You're like... family, I guess. Didn't you call us sisters before? Oh. Silver blushes and averts her eyes. Perhaps. Then that's what we are. Aww. That simple, is it? Yes. <laughs> Yes! Found family is a thing! Yes! It really is. Silver shakes her head and looks around, regaining a bit of her standoffish composure. This is about the time when she'd typically transform and run away. At least tell me before you leave, okay? Whenever it is. She hesitates, but then agrees. Fine. Goodbye, Miho. Bye, Silver. She walks toward me rather than away, and comes to a stop right beside me. We both face in different directions. Slowly she raises a hand, and awkwardly pats me on the shoulder. Just once. By the time I turn my head to look at her, all I can see is the despairing gleam of a silver fox fur as she blends into the night. I'm alone, but I don't feel alone. Looking at my scroll, there are a few new creases from where Silver held onto it, but... They don't mess up the writing or anything, it's just another record of what we've been through together. The breeze from before picks up, making the paper flutter in my grip, and I use two hands to hold it. Seeing without reading, I let my eyes wander over the familiar characters. It's funny, all this time spent not knowing what they said, just to find <laughs> I've lived them- I lived by them all along. Or at least, I've started to. Happiness? 
That's just a new one for me too, I think. Another abstract concept that doesn't seem meant for me, but like everything else, it got easier along the way. I roll my scroll back up and store it safely in my pocket. The woods are dark as I walk through them, but I'm not afraid. The shining light of my bead brightens the path, leading my way back home. Ah! Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Small wonders. Boop. See? Right there. Oh, I'll move me. There we go. Boop. <laughs> We're going to pause this here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for hanging out. I love you all. And let's see you in chapter 5. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>